Hello and welcome to the City Club of Cleveland. I'm Karen Kastler, Ohio State House News Bureau Chief. It's December 16th and you're with a virtual City Club Forum. Over the last few weeks, Common Cause Ohio and the League of Women Voters hosted a series of virtual events focused on government ethics, transparency, and accountability at the Ohio State House. These events followed the high-profile arrest of former House Speaker Larry Householder and four allies as part of an alleged $61 million pay-to-play scheme involving the passage of a huge bailout of nuclear power plants owned by a company that was a subsidiary of First Energy. On November 19th, First Energy reported to the SEC a mysterious $4 million payment to an appointed official directly involved in regulating the utility. The next day, Public Utilities Commission of Ohio Chairman Sam Randazzo resigned. Today, we'll talk to some experts about whistleblowing, strengthening lobbyists and ethics laws, and shining a light on dark money, and discuss what structural changes need to be made to increase accountability and transparency here at the Ohio State House, where I am right now. Joining us today virtually are Dr. Ned Hill, Professor of Economic Development in the John Glenn College of Public Affairs at Ohio State University, Kedrick Payne, General Counsel and Senior Director for Ethics at the Campaign Legal Center, and Catherine Turser, Executive Director of Common Cause Ohio. As in every City Club forum, even the virtual ones, you can participate with your questions. Text them to 330-541-5794. That's 330-541-5794. You can also tweet them at the City Club, and we will try to work them in. So let's start after that introduction with a little alleged corruption 101. I noted in the introduction that the current scandal involves Republican former House Speaker Larry Householder, who, along with four associates, is accused of taking $61 million through a dark money group called Generation Now to pass a sweeping energy bill that included a bailout for Ohio's two nuclear power plants. The money allegedly came from a utility that's widely believed to be for energy. Two of those charged, lobbyist Juan Cespedes and Householder advisor Jeff Longstreth, have pleaded guilty. The Householder and former Ohio Republican Party Chair Matt Borges have publicly said they are innocent. Lobbyist Neil Clark has also pleaded not guilty. Now, the Householder scandal really kind of happened in plain sight. I mean, there were many stories that were written about the connections between Householder and the others charged with him, about the connections between First Energy and First Energy Solutions, the owner of the nuclear power plants. And it came right after the scandal involving Householder's predecessor, Cliff Rosenberger, who was caught up in an FBI investigation into a payday lending bill. No charges were ever filed in that probe. And interestingly, for people who think this is a new problem, well, it's not. In 1999, an Ohio State Senator named Roy Ray of Akron worked as a lobbyist and consultant for Ohio Edison, which is now First Energy, or at least part of it. He voted on bills that favored Ohio Edison, sponsored a bill that would allow power companies, including Ohio Edison, to charge customers for $8 billion in nuclear power plants and other investments. That went unnoticed until Ohio Citizen Action brought it up. He didn't break any laws, but it was secret. And so I want to start with you, Catherine Terser, since you were involved with Ohio Citizen Action at one point. Haven't there been opportunities since 1999 when the Roy Ray situation happened to improve transparency and accountability? One of the things that I think that is really hard is that the problems that we're facing today, the consequences of the House Bill 6, you know, we know we've known this for years and years. It has been very clear that we needed greater transparency at the state house. Now, what happened with um during the Roy Ray era is as opposed to saying, "Oh, we need better disclosure and we need to do something so that we make sure that our legislators are there to represent us and we address conflicts of interest um, more clearly. Instead of doing that, what happened is that they basically closed the records to the Legislative Service Commission. Now, that is the agency that is responsible for crafting bills and researching bills and working with legislators on amendments. And so when you close those records so that we don't get access to it, it becomes much harder for us to understand how bills are created and how legislation comes together. And if you don't actually understand, it's hard to hold these folks accountable. And I think when we look at this this scandal, I think it's very important to realize that there are different areas that were problematic. There's the dark money that was involved in elections. There were the really, really inappropriate ads that were intended to trick, you know, Ohioans into supporting House Bill 6. And there were the xenophobic ads um, that were part of the referendum. 
but we need to be thinking not just about kind of the secret money at the state house and the dark money. We need to also be thinking about better disclosure, for example, of the conflicts of interest at the Public Utilities Commission as well. And we will get to all that. I want to turn this question over to either Kendrick or uh, Ned. There was an argument made back around the Roy Ray time that more stringent disclosure of financial data would keep talented, experienced people from running for office. Is there any evidence that that's the case, that, that that's a reason not to enact more legislation that uh, reveals more transparency? Kendrick, it's yours. Okay, sure. I'll start with that. Um, that argument that more transparency would uh, result in fewer qualified uh, public officials has always been made, and there is no evidence to say that that is true. Uh, one example would be to look at that at the federal level. The federal level has a very uh, stringent requirement for all types of public disclosure of all of the assets and all the liabilities and all of the uh, income of not only the public official, but also their uh, significant other, their their uh, partner. And that has not resulted in uh, any data that shows that the uh, nominees for these positions are less qualified. Uh, it just shows that you have people who are more concerned about serving the public interest than they are about their financial interests. And they're willing to make that sacrifice of letting the public into what their uh, potential conflicts are. So Ned, let me ask you, there's the House bill situation that we're dealing with right now. Several bills have been proposed to repeal House Bill 6. One would delay the charges that are coming to everybody's elected bills in the next couple of weeks. It also includes a provision that its sponsor, Republican and Representative Jim Hoops, described to me as real strong audit language. And I want to ask you, is it? I mean, when I talked to him, he didn't seem to have a whole lot of details about it. Do you think he wrote it? Do you think someone else wrote it? I mean... And also the idea that uh, an audit or an enhanced financial needs assessment, as it's referred to, would determine that uh, the nuclear power plants actually would need the money that would be coming in these subsidies. Well, that was a really simple 400-part question, Karen. Thank you so much. <laughs> um, so let's let's take it piece by piece. The first part is where did the language come from? The sponsor of the bill got tripped up in testimony, uh, couldn't quite explain it, and then ended up saying that the language came from uh, the industrial energy users um, of Ohio, uh, which is the organization that Sam Randazzo uh, formed and um, has had a long, fairly long history of, of doing um, insider deals. I, I consider them to be part of what I call a redistributive coalition, a group of insiders at, who, who um, are at the PUCO who craft carve outs for their members as a way of doing business. Um, and and so, so that needs to be revealed. Um, the second uh, question you have is uh, what about that audit language? Well, the audit language was actually in House Bill 6. Uh, there was an agreement, uh, now House Bill 6 went through, I stopped counting it at the 19th draft, it may have hit 21, had audit language in there and that was boulderized at the last minute um, and um, essentially um, didn't call for an arm's length uh, audit on the on the part of an entity other than than um, uh, that other than one that was supported by the utility itself, which is nonsense. So that's a problem. What does the language look like? The second problem with the audit is there's a catch twenty two. Now I realize some of our audience may not be as old as me and not under, understand what that means. But it means that 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 it that within the way the um, the bankruptcy court dealt with um, First Energy Solutions bankruptcy, uh, and and we're going to have to follow the connect the dots here. So First Energy spun off its generating assets and First Energy Solutions into a new company called Energy Harbor and loaded it with debt that was associated. With the with with those power plants, not just in Ohio, but also a really bad business investment they made in Pennsylvania and West Virginia. The job of the bankruptcy court is to take the liabilities of the company, its 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 loans, its bonds, its its all of its debtedness, and trim it down to a level that its expected revenue can support. Now, 
when the bankruptcy judge was doing this, House Bill Six miraculously got passed as at the in the late later days of the bankruptcy court hearing. So, so the judge by law had to counted all the revenues from House Bill Six as revenues to Energy Harbor, which meant that the level of debt and the bonds were only, were reduced were, were reduced as much as it should as much as it should have been if those subsidies weren't there. So if you do an audit and say, what will happen to the financial viability of Energy Harbor if those subsidies aren't there? Of course, it's going to show that Energy Harbor, if it's not upside down, is in great financial distress because it was built and constructed assuming that all those revenues are going to be there. Self-fulfilling prophecy. Um, so it's the same way that, that those of us who spent in Cleveland finally learned at great pain that we had a highly competitive set of steel mills down in the valley after it went through, I forgot it was three or four bankruptcies to get the debt and the load shed, have the working conditions taken care of. Unfortunately, the workers lost pension in it. But out of that came a very competitive steel mill that ArcelorMittal has run for years and recently sold off to, um, to a Cleveland-based um, steel making firm and makes the finest sheet in, in the United States. That wouldn't have happened if the bankruptcy court hadn't done its job. And what we have in this case, because of the revenue from House Bill 6, the bankruptcy court was, was prohibited from doing its job. You're right. That was a, a great explanation of a very complicated thing here. I want to turn my next question here to uh, both Edric and Catherine, I mean, when we start talking about House Bill 6 and, and all the things that are in it, I mean, there's an argument to be made that there's a need to keep the power plants open. I mean, they employ 4,300 people indirectly or directly, they pay $30 million in state and local taxes, they produce a lot of zero carbon electricity. So how do we get to this point where this is legislation that can be, can do all that, but can people can have confidence in it? Well, this becomes really complicated to talk about, but what we what we do know is that the process in which House Bill 6 was created actually was so corrupt that we cannot assume that the structure that they established in House Bill 6 is works. And so, you know, for example, you know, there there are lots of us that would say, "Oh, well, we maybe we should do something for this company that might go out of business. What should we do?" And I think we have to take a moment and say, well, wait a second. Um, there are a lot of us right now that are truly, truly suffering. And we could all use a bailout. And yet we're all just trying to figure out how to make it work. And at some point, this is just corporate welfare for a failing business after First Energy has made um, some bad business decisions. And um, the way that they, how can I put this, bad business decisions. And then clearly if they have, you know, $60 million um, to uh, influence the process, maybe they should be stop investing in Ohio politics and start focusing on their own companies. Yeah, Kedrick, I want to ask you about that. The idea that money plays such a huge role, but can be considered to be problematic for the system. I mean, as I was doing some research to prepare for the show, I was listening to my colleague WSU's Ann Fisher, her show, All Sides, on this topic. And I heard former executive director of the Ohio Retirement Study Council, uh, uh, Council Aristotle Huttress, say, no one is suggesting lobbyists or industry can help write legislation. But are we suggesting that that's what happened here and, and that money really did play a, a huge role in getting this long discussed proposal passed? Yes, I mean, this definitely looks as though the amount of money spent for influencing not only the uh, legislators who were uh, receiving the dark money to help their campaigns, but also the money spent on these ad campaigns to influence the public resulted in a very successful uh, 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 scheme to get this legislation passed. And the, the, the question then really comes down to not so much is the legislation good or bad, but what should be disclosed to the public so that they can have all the facts necessary to know whether or not this is something that they would like their representative to vote yay or nay on. Uh, so when you get into a situation where all this money is spent to provide misinformation, that becomes a problem. 
uh, if you had the same amount of, mo amount of money spent that was to uh, just provide true information, then it's just uh, essentially the exercise of the First Amendment. Uh, but the balance comes when you have this misinformation versus uh, true information. I, I want to ask you about the money that continues to come in here. Uh, there are plenty of people who think that money really does influence lawmakers and legislation, especially when you're talking about First Energy, big companies, spreads money around a lot. Both Speaker Bob Cop and Jim Hoops, the representative I, I re referenced earlier, who actually chairs the select committee that's hearing these repeal bills, they've received thousands of dollars from First Energy. This money's disclosed, though. I mean, it's on their financial sheet. So... Is that not enough? Wow. So what I would say is clearly we have some disclosure, which is good. So we should understand the contributions that go directly to candidates. But it is really important for us to look at disclosure and transparency as a tool for accountability. Now, if, for example, um, we had all watched Generation Now ads on television and we, and we were able to clearly understand, not just, you know, try to connect the dots and figure it out, but it was clearly stated on that ad, hey, the first, you know, major don donations by First Energy, we would understand that they were trying to get the bailout and they were spending so much money. How many of us got multiple mailers and there were TV ads and we would understand when we saw those, you know, those really xenophobic ads, we would say, Oh, that's first ed energy. Um, then, then there's that whole thing of, you know, would they even behave better? I do think, you know, I do think that when we, look for transparency we can identify what we have already and and the 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 public good so that you know i guess justice brandeis said that sunlight is the best disinfectant and you know i think that's completely true but we we don't have enough we aren't able to understand who is funding political advertisements and i think kedrick was getting at this earlier um we also don't have good disclosure of money spent to influence the public um, when there's legislation being considered so that, you know, we have lobbyist disclosure, but we don't have the kind of disclosure that would show the kind of additional, what they sometimes call grassroots lobbying, but the, the kind of mailers that go to people or the, the ways that would encourage people to support a bailout of a, a subsidiary of a major company that made some bad business decisions. Sure. I want to talk, I'll go yeah. ahead, Ned. If yeah. I could, yeah. Your setup actually was wrong. Um, and so I, I just wanted to clear up some of the, some of the, um, the myths that are going around about the two nuclear plants in particular. The first thing is First Energy never showed any data at all about the operating efficiency of those plants. Um, the only two independent pieces of work that were done about that plant showed that if they were shorn of all that debt from their bad business decisions, that those plants are competitive. They are probably, that, that we have seen from, from PJM, which is the regional transmission organization, PJM's monitor, is those are technically the two most efficient single uh, boiler nuclear plants in the United States. So it, it really, it, what makes them uncompetitive is the debt load on top of them. Second mistake, and, and the legislature has been eating this one, like watching, watching a pig eat slop, is this notion that somehow we are vulnerable if those plants go down. The fact is the state of Ohio has imported energy every year that I have seen data for with the exception of one year. In fact, what's happened is since we be became uh, less reliant on, on Ohio generated electricity and been part of this 13 state network, the reliability of the electricity generated, generated is more than doubled and the prices have gone down. So the more we focus become uh, proud of Buckeye electrons, uh, the less reliable the system is and the more expensive it gets. And that's exactly what the owners of legacy plants want us to do. So when you were saying I was wrong, you were just saying that relying on that argument that we need those nuclear power plants is, is the wrong thing. That uh, There's still people who are employed by them. They still pay taxes, though. Uh, well, they still pay taxes and uh, accept much lower taxes because they've taken those plants and marked them down to what they think the market value is, and they aren't paying property taxes anymore. 
what they're what the most important generator of taxes is the wage taxes from the workers. If those plants are shut down, you have 30 years of wage taxes coming from those workers. They disassemble the plant. So, so this has been a a argument made of half truth. Not even they can't even get up to half truths. And he's right. You are not wrong. You accurately reported the myths that have been going around the legislature. All right. Well, let's talk a little bit uh, going on disclosure in the next stage of this. Apparently, uh, the the next thing that might be related to the householder scandal is what's happening to the Public Utilities Commission of Ohio. The UCO chair, Sam Randazzo's house was raided by the FBI last month. He resigned not long after. In his resignation, as I said in the intro, he admitted an SEC filing from First Energy noting a four million dollar payment to a person described as someone subsequently appointed to a full-time role as an Ohio government official directly involved in regulating First Energy would hang over any decisions that he might make. It's believed that $4 million went to Randazzo's Sustainability Funding Alliance. Randazzo had filed out his financial disclosure statement correctly, apparently, but did not include that $4 million that was apparently paid to his business, if indeed he was the recipient of this money. So how do we fix this? If, if that's what happened here, how do we fix this? and make this something that people can know. Uh, I'll say that that's a very easy fix that has been addressed in other laws. So in the federal law, you are required as a new public servant to list all of your employers, your sources of income, such as uh, what Randezzo had to list with his consulting firms. But the law also recognizes that you could easily hide the money that comes from a client that goes to your employer and it comes to you. So there's a special rule that says if you receive more than $5,000 from a specific client uh, for which you perform services, then you also in, uh, put that client uh, on your financial disclosures. That, I mean, it's such an easy way to av avoid disclosure that there's already a, uh, a fix for it. And that should be applied in, uh, in the Ohio law. Well, and I do think that in the meantime, because of course we are going to ask legislators to make this fix and let's face it, lame duck is wrapping up and it'll take a little while for them to get started when, when we get to 2021. In the meantime, all of the commissioners or folks that are, you know, being considered to become the new commissioner to fill Sam Randazzo's spot, which, you know, should happen by the end of the month, right? Um, we can ask them to voluntarily disclose all of their work with utilities. We can ask them to voluntarily take the step that Kedrick was talking about so that we do not end up with yet one more commissioner on the Public Utilities Commission of Ohio that is, you know, so closely tied to utilities. Because, of course, you know, Ohioans deserve better. You know, when we think about it, so many of us are really struggling to pay our utility bills. And to, you know, these folks are supposed to not just think about, you know, the, I don't know, future of our, the businesses around Ohio, but they should be thinking about us. They should be focusing on consumers. And so, you know, voluntary disclosure is a step that the commissioners could take today. And so could anybody who is applying to become part of the Public Utilities Commission. But that's obviously voluntary. That's on them. And I want to ask uh, Ned about this. Um, you know, we have a list of things that lawmakers and state officials have to disclose, sources of income, names of clients, amounts received, that kind of thing. Um, Common Cause recently sent a letter demanding what Catherine just said, that the four remaining UCO commissioners voluntarily and immediately disclose past and present work for the industry that they regulate. Are there other things that need to be disclosed? For instance, tax returns or payments from entities that they might regulate? Uh, I think that's absolutely fine. It should be there. It should be part of it. Um, it, again, at the federal level, you should, there's, there is law for some and custom for others that was recently violated by the current president um, to disclose all that. And we also understand that if, if, if you look at the Constitution, um, in fact, you can go back to the Articles of Confederation, there was great concern about emoluments, which means financial dependency. Interestingly enough, in the Articles of Confederation, the emoluments listed was domestic and foreign. So this is a longstanding, under, we understand that human beings are venial. Human beings uh, act in their own self-interest. Uh, many of us have, um, and, 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 and 
also um, also act out of a sense of doing the right thing, but we have to make it easier to keep on doing the right thing, and the and, and that's transparency. Um, the other thing that you know, we, I, I understand Citizens United was a Supreme Court case, but that is underneath all of this. There is a legal fiction that corporations are individuals with the rights of all other individuals, including freedom of speech. Well, the financial uh, wherewithal of corporations, coupled with the rate of return they can get from those political investments, is so different that there should be a different level, different version of speech. I mean, we, we, I think we do have to understand and, and possibly work at the law to change the legal definition of the personhood of a corporation. Um, and and until Citizens United is taking is cleaned up, we are going to be fighting this forever. We're going to go to audience questions, and I'm already getting some, and they're really good. But I want one more question to ask you folks uh, before we do that. Uh, among those who've expressed interest in the position that's now open on the PUCO is uh, Ohio Supreme Court Justice Judy French. She lost to Democrat Jennifer Bruner last month. She certainly has experience in looking at utility issues from her years on the court. And in that particular Supreme Court case and the other one, there was dark money from Karl Rove involved in the U.S. in the, the court case. So I'm just wondering, should we expect something like that? I mean, these commissioners aren't elected, they're appointed, but there's still a lot of information that could potentially be released about them. And, and on that subject, should we appoint public utilities commissioners? Should we instead elect them? I'm, I'm just wondering what your thoughts are. <laughs> But uh, with the election question, they should not be elected because wait until the dark money issue is cleaned up. Because if you could, I mean, buying or or influencing um, the uh, election for a PUCO commissioner, or anything that's far down the ballot, where that where where the information is harder to get and the votes drop out as you go further down the ballot, it's so much easier to control um, to to influence that vote. The other reason why I don't think we should is that with gerrymandering, uh, what we have is we've got districts with, which which kind of rule out the middle of politics and it accentuates the extremes. And so therefore you'll have these commissioners essentially coming through or could could be coming through uh, through the through the primary system. Um, and that um, scares the bejesus out of me. Hedrick or Catherine, you want to weigh in before we go to some audience questions? So I think we should be really thinking big. Um, and when I say that, you know, we've been engaging in conversations thinking about, well, how can we do accountability? How can we increase transparency so that we better understand the problem? And so one of the things as we're going through and talking about all this is if we understand the problem as we do not have a consumer voice on the Public Utilities Commission, for example, if we understand that you know they are not there for us, well, then we start to think about well, should we actually consider um, consider electing them? And you'll you'll remember um, this would have been you know in the '80s, um, Henry Eckert, who was on our board for many years, me and Common Cause Ohio's board for many years. What, and he was a public utilities commission uh, chair at one point. He um, was really promoting um, the election of the public utilities commission so that they would better represent us. Now, clearly, there is a, a significant problem with dark money. I, I don't think that Ned is wrong about that. I just think that one of the things that we know is that the Supreme Court and Citizens United said, hey, um, corporations have the right to engage in speech or um, do for political advertisements. Um, they are permitted to do that. Um, they also said that disclosure was constitutional. They, Correct. And, and in fact, I think that part is really important. And so, you know, one of the things that we have been living with and are experiencing consequences of is we have not done the kind of disclosure that the Supreme Court expected us to do. And we haven't done it at the federal level. We haven't done it in our state. And so, you know, in, I actually have this in front of me. This is a, this is a line of, of, from Citizens United versus FEC. Um, that prompt disclosure is important. Shareholders can determine whether their corporation's political speech advances the corporation's interest in making a profit, and citizens can see whether elected officials are in the pocket of so-called money interests. 
And I think, you know, one of the things we need to do is say in the past 10 years, you, uh, Ned mentioned the gerrymandering in the past 10 years, money was used in 2010 to influence, influence on um, the makeup of the state house so that there would be one party um, to do the map making. And so if you'll remember when we were going into, into election 2010, the house was a democratic house and the Senate was Republican and money was spent by the Republican, um, it's our Republican state legislative uh, committee to actually influence the, the makeup of the state houses in Wisconsin, Ohio, Pennsylvania, and, and North Carolina. And that has influenced us for nearly a decade. We deserve to have really good disclosure. Um, yes, it, may, it will take a lot to actually change, you know, money equaling speech. And, you know, you can think about how this can, can, is an obstacle. But we, what we can do right now is do something so that we better understand who is trying to influence our legislators and who is trying to influence us. Kedrick, any final thoughts before we go to audience questions? Yeah, yeah. One final point is that uh, I think one theme here is that this is complex corruption and it requires complex reform. And it's good that we're looking at the very particular things that need to be changed, such as how do you select people for uh, the Public Utility Commission? But this is broader than that because this scheme actually set the uh, blueprint for anyone who would want to uh, do this type of corruption in the future, which may be a different industry. So the reform should focus not only on the dark money <clears throat> and the ethics and the lobbying law, uh, but it should be the disclosure that uh, Catherine mentioned, mm -hmm. understanding that the disclosure is just the first part to having even more enforcement. Because once you have the disclosure and you have the sunlight, then there can be the audit mechanism that can come not only from the public looking at these uh, this disclosure, but also the ethics enforcement uh, mechanism that can then hold people accountable when these types of violations occur in the future. All right. Well, if you have any questions for our speakers, if you're watching this virtual forum right now, we really appreciate it. So go ahead and text your questions to 330-541-5794. It's 330-541-5794. You can also tweet them at the City Club. We'll try to work them in. We've gotten a couple really good ones so far. So let me start out with this one. Isn't there a baseline issue of what gets defined by law as what the public gets to know versus what we deserve to know and are entitled to know? The very people who need to be transparent are also crafting the definition, and that can be a big problem. Well, I think you just, you know, this question hit the nail on the head. You know, one of the things that we are asking legislators to do is change the rules that impact them. And that can be, a, that just can be an incredible challenge. And yet this scandal, which I, and I want to highlight again, two folks have pled guilty. So like, you know, and this is an, un, you know, there's going to be a slow unveiling and we'll learn more and everything, but we should take this very seriously. And so should our legislators. We deserve better. And, and I would add to this, I want to agree with something that Catherine said before. You're, Catherine, you're absolutely right. Citizens United expected accountable speech. And I, and, um, I have no problem with businesses um, expressing accountable speech. You have to be accountable. That's the important thing about sunlight. Uh, and... I don't want to control, to control the forum for debate. That's free speech. But uh, free speech that is done uh, without accountability, particularly on large moneyed interests, um, ends up with what we've got in Ohio. I mean, I'm starting to think that, that our um, re new retirement plan is the FBI coming in. Well, Kendrick, anything? <laughs> you're, you're in Cuyahoga County. I mean, you know, we, we realized that we had 60 public officials convicted at there up there at one point in time. We've got a slow rolling disaster roll, rolling out in Cincinnati. Again, allegations, offshoot of House Bill 6. Um, and no matter how you cut it with the allegations in Columbus, two people have pled guilty. Um, we've got two speakers under investigation. And you got so much cash running, or you know, washing back and forth on that bathtub, um, that that it, it is affecting decisions. And the, the only thing I will add is that it, yes, it is true that uh, the legislators are the ones who are going to uh, essentially define what the disclosure is. But the 
encouraging news is to know that across the 50 states, there are states that are, have had legislators who define disclosure broadly, and it works. Like this is not an impossible task. And you will see that the organizations that are required to make these disclosures will comply. I mean, just a simple search of your uh, lobbying laws in, in Ohio, just look at the disclosure that a company makes in Ohio versus what that same company discloses in a state like New York is, is mind blowing. And they are those organizations are easily able to still conduct business, still able to uh, uh, comply with the laws in this more uh, robust disclosure regime of New York as they are in Ohio, but they're just not held to that standard. And it's on uh, uh, the citizens to uh, put the pressure on their representatives to require more. Another question here. Please explain how greater transparency with the Legislative Service Commission might reduce dark money in Ohio. And I think here we're talking a little bit about uh, the Jim Siegel Amendment uh, that uh, named for my former colleague from the Columbus Dispatch, the late, great Jim Siegel. Uh, tell me a little bit about that. Catherine, I know you've been involved in that one. So I think we often talk about dark money and what we're talking about is secret money. What the, the Jim Siegel Disclosure Bill is focused on making sure that we are able to get records from the Legislative Service Commission, meaning it's about making sure that there is a less secret process for making new legislation so that we know who's actually writing the bills. And, you know, a lot of us, you know, you know, do you remember I'm only a bill? Yes, I'm only a bill. You know, we get this idea that, you know, it's, it's schoolhouse rock there, but, but what we know, for, especially as we look at this kind of unveiling of all of this corruption is that we need to have access to information about who is influencing, you know, new amendments uh, uh, that are created by this agency that is a nonpartisan agency that is tasked with writing bills and researching, you know, legislation for our legislators. And so it is not, it's, it's somewhat separate from the dark money, which I think of as like secret money in elections or um, secret money that is um, influencing um, our legislators. This is saying, okay, we need access to this information. We need transparency so that we can influence the process and make sure that our legislators are actually listening to us rather than special interests. And when you talk about the Jim Siegel Amendment and opening up the Legislative Service Commission, this is a group, this is an, an office here in the State House that helps lawmakers with all sorts of things with regard to legislation, but that would allow for the opening up of correspondence between legislators and the NLSC, and, and you could try to find out a little bit more about how these laws are actually created and where they come from, and, and so I think that that's, that's a big part of knowing what happens at the Legislative Service Commission would be great. I mean, we have that opportunity at the federal level when federal officials can release some of those reports that they get. We just don't have that here. I, you know, and I just, I just think, you know, the ability to figure out who is adding a questionable amendment will help when it comes time to vote for these people. It's much easier to, to actually make sure that our legislators are responsible for legislation they create if we have access to this information. Well, and Catherine and Karen, it does one other thing, which is important, is if you know who wrote the or drafted the original amendment, there's a little flag to it. So you'd say, all right, let's see what this language really means and how does it structure benefits? One of the, the hard things if you're reading bills is that the it's usually written in a very arcane and obtuse way, referring back to many other bills. And it's hard to really track through and see what happens. And frankly, the amount of time and effort I put into tracking that down frequently depends on who I think it's going to benefit. Um, because then I, I could kind of, the radar comes up. And if you don't have the radar, you can get snowed by some very obscure language and say, okay, fine. Uh, I hope a lawyer friend comes to talk to me soon to tell me what I just read. Speaking of lawyers, this question has come in a couple of times. Is anyone going to jail over this? What's the likelihood that First Energy and or any of its executives will face criminal charges? Is it more likely the utility will just end up writing a big dollar settlement check without admitting any wrongdoing. Now, I'm not a lawyer, so I certainly have no idea. Anybody want to handle that one? Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll take Kedrick. Yeah, <laughs> sir. I'll, I'll touch on the, the, the high level part. I mean, the the uh, criminal charges are there. Uh, I mean, it's bribery and, and other criminal charges. So 
it is possible, very possible that someone will uh, do jail time. And and because there's, there's an ongoing investigation, it's hard to know whether there are individuals within First Energy who also may be caught up on that. I think it's going to come to the intent. And I will say that with such an orchestrated scheme, this is an impressive scheme. I mean, it was successful because it was well thought out. Uh, I think you will be able to find some uh, paper trails that will show the intent necessary for criminal charges to result in, in jail time. And, and the other thing that we don't know is what's the SEC going to do, the Securities and Exchange Commission is going to end up doing on this. Um, and, um, you know, I, I think that we should be aware that we aren't the only state going through this. Um, utilities for years have been like an octopus. Um, and they can play very outsized large roles in state legislators. So, I mean, actually, the FBI was very bipartisan in taking down speakers the week they took down ours. They took down the Democratic speaker in Illinois. Um, and I also, I think there was a, a similar thing, maybe in South Carolina, there's something else going on as well. Um, so there is, what we're seeing is as utilities have a technologically outdated generation and just and, and transmission network. They're trying to protect those investments from competition by using their political power to generate market power. And so they're using their influence at the state level, including in utility commissions, to protect themselves and their stockholders. Um, and this has, for Ohio, you know, we talk about, oh, this is an economic development problem if those plants go down in, um, in, in, along the shores of Lake Erie. Now, it's also an economic development problem when our electricity rates are higher than our, competi our competing states. And, and one thing I want to add here, and I want to make sure that I understand this right, Catherine, uh, as I understand it, Larry Householder can use campaign donations in his defense in this case, right? <laughs> okay, so so the thing that I think we need to be really clear about is that campaign funds are not supposed to be used for personal benefit. And we should also understand that there are campaign contribution limits. And if a candidate is organizing a, um, you know, political ads, or they're, I don't know, responsible, for example, for Generation Now, they basically are doing things to benefit their own campaigns, right? And, and in this case, the campaigns of their friends, but it was a way really to violate campaign finance law. Now we don't, you know, we don't talk a lot about that, but I think when you think about the, 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 the challenge, the challenge is that um, the, that the elections commission does permit some campaign finance funds to be used for these things, but they should not be, they really clearly should not be. And I, you know, I was thinking earlier about, um, you know, the, where we are and like, I don't know if you remember the Noe scandal from 15 years ago, I would say some, some of our participants are too young for this, but I think, you know, the thing is any investigation takes a while to kind of unveil and we get more and more information as we, as we go along. But what we need to remember this, we're, this is a bribery case, right? Racketeering and bribery. If, if there's a bribery case, somebody got bribed, right? And so, you know, as we're going through this, we just need to be patient and see what comes out of it and and just kind of wait and, you know, keep reading the newspaper. Or watching television or listening to the radio. Uh, <laughs> I, uh, another question here. Shouldn't people who have received money from First Energy, such as Judy French, be disqualified from the PUCO? How can you be expected to regulate an industry that has contributed to your prior campaigns? Well, I will take that, although I was just talking, which is why I was a little hesitant to do so. Um, I do feel as if um, when someone receives what are pretty markedly large campaign contributions over a long period of time, um, we, you know, we know that, you know, how can I put this? Um, political action committees do not give campaign contributions out of the goodness of their heart. They are trying to find decision makers who will who are pro business and will support them. And I'm not saying this is an exact quid pro quo. I'm talking about that. First Energy certainly appears to see Judy French as somebody who would be supportive of them on the court. 
And so, and we certainly know that in most cases, that was in fact the case with Judy French. So it really doesn't make sense for Judy French to be added, especially at this time period, to the Public Utilities Commission. It just doesn't make any sense. So I'll take a, a little bit softer role on this. And that is, I believe everything should be revealed. The history of investment by First Energy in specific politicians should be revealed. But the way the PCO um, selection process works, and, and, and I do believe that the um, selection committee is extremely pro-utility, and, and um, is that the final deci decision maker is the governor. And the governor is going to have to make the decision as to how much exposure um, he's going to take by um, as he evaluates the 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 fundraising baggage of whoever um, is are among the, the the four or five that are presented to him. Who chairs that uh, committee that's going to nominate uh, somebody? Who, who's in charge of that now? Uh, it's the former First Energy lobbyist. I just wanted to get that, that out there. <laughs> but I know but that's the problem. And and in fact, and and, and the labor representative um, has his connections to the Inter International Brotherhood of Electrical Workers, uh, which uh, which represents the employees of the nuclear plants. Um, and 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 uh, I, this is a small friendly disagreement with, that I have with Catherine in depicting that the consumers aren't represented and businesses are. I I, I actually don't think businesses are either. I think utilities are represented. And, and that distinction is important. Here's another question, kind of getting at what Catherine was talking about with the Noe scandal and some of these other things. Why does it seem that Ohio politics are so corrupt? House Bill 6, payday loan scandal, ECOT. What else besides dark money is causing this? Kendrick, I, maybe you want to weigh in with a, a large overview of this? Yeah, yeah, I think the key part to how you can respond to a scandal and hopefully not get a brand for being a, a state of scandals is to have the reform cover multiple parts of, um, it's called political law, of campaign finance, lobbying, and ethics. So what I mean by that is this, it may be the case that these scandals keep occurring because any type of reform uh, may only focus on, let's say, uh, the campaign finance part of it or uh, just the ethics part of it, but I think that hasn't been much reform at all. But you must understand that all three things are so linked because all three laws govern how industry influences uh, all, uh, lawmakers. So I would just encourage that not only would there be reform with the lobbying campaign finance and ethics laws, but also that needs to be enforcement mechanisms. The ethics commission must be able to effectively audit and hold people accountable who are not complying with the law. And that starts with the one thing we keep discussing, disclosure. The more you disclose, the more that is known, the more that can be enforced, and the more your laws can evolve. Another question. Is there any problematic connection between the American Legislative Exchange Council and Ohio state lawmakers. Uh, and that, that's a council that has written model legislation uh, for many different states. And it brings back the question of who actually writes legislation and, and, and why. So is there, a, is there a problematic connection between ALEC as it's known and, and what's happening at the state house? Um, I, I, Karen, I don't think that there is, it, but it should, again, it's a disclosure issue. Um, legislators go to um, Republican legislators just put the very conservative ones go to ALEC meetings and get ideas about legislation from those meetings um, and sometimes the background of support. At the same time, legislatures go to the National Conference of State Legislators and get ideas from other legislators on issues that, they're, that they deal with. They've got, um, you know, commissions or uh, they've got committees on budgeting and workforce on and on. Um, so the ideas can come from anywhere. It's, it's being able to, to trace them that makes the difference. Well, and it's interesting because I would I would say certainly we know that Bill Seitz is very active, um, state rep, um, is very active um, with the American Legislative um, Exchange Council. And, and probably know, so. 
and and probably so. And I think one of the the reasons why it would be really good to get access to the records at the Legislative Service Commission or pass the Jim Siegel disclosure bill is is that um, we would be able to see how many um, you know model what kind of model legislation from Alec was actually handed directly to um, the Legislative Service Commission, and we would be able to more easily, you know, connect the dots. And certainly we can think of, you know, stand your ground um, legislation, and we can think about a bunch of other legislation that has been um, proposed by ALEC. Um, and certainly, you know, um, having good information will help us be better citizen lobbyists. And so that's the other part of this, you know, disclosure is to give us tools so that we have greater accountability. And, you know, when you were talking about kind of the culture of like a culture of corruption, we need to think about all the different guardrails that we can put in place so that there is behavior, better behavior that is really focused on Ohioans focused on the voters. So the, the disclosure guardrails and the ethical guardrails are all about making sure that, you know, legislators clearly understand it's in their best interest to focus on all of us. But it's also our responsibility to really pay attention to the kind of information that is available and to do what we can to influence the process. You know, um, we are you know, we are responsible for the government and we need to think about ourselves as people that are engaged and paying attention so that we can cut through this corruption. Yes, the FBI has a really significant job, but so do all of us. You got it. Another question here. Would love to hear the panelists' thoughts on what federal legislation is needed to address these concerns and the likelihood it might pass if Congress is split and Republicans retain control of the Senate. I mean, when you start talking about Citizens United, one thing that occurs to me is the people who are in Congress, most of those people are lawyers. If there were a desire or an incentive or a motivation to write some legislation that would fix some of the problems with Citizens United, wouldn't it be done? It will only happen if people push from the outside because those who benefit from the current flows of cash are going to keep them there. Uh, yeah, yeah, I, I do. I think one ironic part of, of this all is that because there's no longer really a limit to how much a lobbyist can give in campaign contributions because of Citizens United and it can go to these dark money groups. The lobbyists are also tired of being asked to make so many contributions. Okay. They now can no longer say, hey, I've maxed out, can't give. They are constantly being uh, uh, requested to provide a lot of money. So you, one a lever that most people may not see that may end up being poor is that the lobbyists will get tired of having to pay out unlimited amounts of money uh, just to feel as though they're getting the goodwill of lawmakers. Well, and clearly they feel extorted. I mean, they're not going to necessarily say it really publicly, but mm -hmm. when you think of the the what we might call the higher gun lobbyists that are around the state house, um, I'm sure that they would prefer a system that's much more accountable. And what's the hope for that, though? Well, we're here today. We're here today. I think, you know, one of the things that happens is when you have a scandal of this proportion, you just, it's just so clear that there is this enormous challenge and that we deserve better. And I'm just really hoping that more and more people are engaged and are pushing because we are getting really terrible legislation and decisions are being made that are hurting us and we need to make some changes today. So what about can, at the federal level? Well, if, at the federal level, let's go back to it. Is go, you know, the the unfinished business on, on Citizens United. That that's we need it, um, and it's easier to do it at the state level if the feds do it as well. Um, you know, what keeps on coming back is a cartoon that I saw in the New Yorker um, as. During the uh, Cuyahoga County scandals, uh, before um, when Jimmy Demora et al. were were um, looking for their public housing retirement package, um, and there was these were these were two people in prison, and one looked at the other and said, "I really thought our level of corruption was well within community standards." 
<laughs> well, and so what happens is that, that in Ohio, there is a culture of accepting this and saying, oh, it's just those politicians. Um, and in some ways, we've just become numb to it. And I, I want to have one final uh, audience question here. We got a lot of really good ones, but uh, what this one goes to Kendrick. Uh, let me find it here. <laughs> Do most, and you kind of touched on this a little bit earlier, do most or at least many other states have the transparency requirements that prevent the kind of concealment and dark money issues that allows this abuse in Ohio? Uh, many do. Uh, so it, it's very complicated because there are so many different parts of the disclosure to talk about uh, with this scandal in Ohio. But when it comes to lobbying disclosure, when it comes to conflicts of interest disclosure of people who may be on a uh, utility commission, other states have this and uh, have this type of disclosure and is easily accessible uh, because there's the, the key thing to see a difference between Ohio and other states is the uh, modernization of the disclosure. If you have a this this these things disclosed, but you really can't search it with a computer and you really can't find it, records then is not effective. But uh, there are many states that are now creating dashboards so that on the uh, uh, commission's website you can clearly see where there are conflicts, where there's money going to different lawmakers and raise the red flag so that the citizens and uh, watchdog groups can uh, so serve that function of holding their members accountable. And, and Kendrick, with, with technology, you, you don't have to have these lags we have now where the report comes out after the election. So it right. should be as soon as the check gets received or the electronic funds transfer takes place, boom, it's, 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 it's up in public. That's right. The technology exists. Well, oh, I was going to say, oh, go ahead, Catherine. I was going to say, two weeks ago, um, John Husted's Innovate Ohio came out with the, this data portal, which mm -hmm. primarily was, you know, it's just a beginning, but it, you know, the ability to look at all of these different graphics related to our health concerns related to COVID, and like it just had all of these beautiful graphics, and you can look at the state checkbook. And I started to get really excited thinking about the kind of campaign finance and ethics and lobbyist filings and the kind of graphics that that could be created you know we uh, you know we often complain about 2020 um, but we also are in a time period where technology um, can actually help and you know create more robust disclosure I want to close with uh, this question. One of my State House Press Corps colleagues and friends, the great Laura Bischoff from Dayton Daily News, has said the best way to make sure that uh, consumers and taxpayers aren't getting ripped off by the government is for people to read the damn newspaper. And again, I would argue that you should watch television and listen to the radio as well. Because reporters like her and my State House News Bureau colleague Andy Chow and others have been writing and talking about House Bill 6 since it was introduced, following this case all the way through. But news coverage has been collapsing because there's no money here. I mean, venture capital firms are buying newsrooms, they're laying people off. So if news coverage collapses because people don't consume news to that point, well, then how can we educate people and, and get people to demand more from the government? Well, I guess a great, a little bit. people are consuming. They just aren't consuming the advertising that supports the news. And, and so it, it, it's just, it's really hard. I mean, it, it's, it's easier than ever for me to read five newspapers a day or five news portals a day, which I do. Um, and you're seeing um, things like the Capital Letter and the Capital Journal pop up, uh, but it still doesn't make up for a hollowed out press corps. Um, and and that, that's a, that's, there's a revenue problem underneath all news media that I'm just not smart enough to solve. Well, and I just, I think that we need to be really clear that when local newspapers die, corruption Come ramps back. up. So like, and, and there's, you know, I, I don't have a study off the top of my head at the moment for this, but there are studies indicating just how important the, you know, how important the press is to making sure we have good accountable government. And so I'm hoping, Karen, that you will do a, an, in a, a program that looks at the intersection of, um, of corruption and the problems with the media, because democracy is intended citizen engagement, some really good rules, good disclosure, and it's also access to information, because information is power. And, and so we really do need to address this, this problem and come up with a solution together. And, and going back to, to the PUCO, We've gone from three to four reporters that used to cover PUCO daily to none. 
That's right. Kendrick, I'll give you the last word. I think you touched on a very important problem, which is that it is essential to have the media and those who are on the ethics beat and those who are on like the public utility beat to be active. Now, even if that is not through a newspaper, the uh, journalists have to uh, adapt to the new technology as well. And if that means getting the word out through other uh, means, uh, whether that's Twitter or something else that doesn't look like the way it used to look, it can still be effective if you have one uh, essential part, and that is an enforcement mechanism, an ethics agency that is truly working such that when they get the tip that comes from a report uh, of an a, a, a investigative journalist, they actually can do something. Because even when the public learns about it, it's not much the public can do. But if you have that ethics enforcement mechanism, something can be done. All right. Well, thank you for joining us for today's forum on the future of transparency and accountability at the State House. We've been talking with Dr. Ned Hill, professor of economic development in the John Glenn College of Public Affairs at The Ohio State University, Cedric Bain, general counsel and senior director for ethics at the Campaign Legal Center, and Catherine Gerser, executive director of Common Cause Ohio. This forum is presented in partnership with Common Cause Ohio and the League of Women Voters of Greater Cleveland. All City Club forums are sponsored by Bank of America, the Cleveland Foundation, Eaton, the George Gunn Foundation, KeyBank, Nordson, the Northeast Ohio Regional Sewer District, and PNC, and the many more generous members, sponsors, and donors listed on their website at cityclub.org slash thank you. You can join them in supporting this work when you make a contribution online or become a member at cityclub.org. I'm Karen Kassler. Thanks for joining us today. Our forum is adjourned.